This is a word for today. This is a word for our church. I believe it's a word for our community as well. Amen? Somebody say, I'm listening. The way that this message came to me um, over a month ago was I didn't plan on grace. Somebody say that with me. Say, I didn't plan on grace. I didn't plan on grace. I didn't expect grace. Uh, I didn't foresee that God's grace would be uh, in operation in my life. Amen. Um, I, I, it's crazy now. Oh, I got so much on my heart today. Y'all, y'all look at me and just say, take your time, Pastor Darren. Got so much, got so much on my heart. Let's, let me start with some scriptures here. I didn't plan on grace. Ephesians chapter 2. We're entering into, it was prophesied uh, a couple of years ago, I think by two different ministers, actually maybe two or three different ministers, uh, but the one that uh, initially came to my mind was uh, Reverend Joe Morris was here with us a couple of years ago. He was just with us here recently, and we were at the Dixie Grill, and uh, he turned around and looked at me as we were walking out of the restaurant, and he said, uh, Pastor Darren, he said, you're about to enter into a season of rest. Somebody say rest. rest. And he said where you struggled, and I hadn't talked to him. I didn't tell him all about the last season, a lot of the stuff we'd been going through. He said you're about to enter into a season of rest, and he said you're going to enjoy yourself. You're going to enjoy your life, and you're going to enjoy what you're, going to do, what you're doing for the Lord. Amen? Somebody say enjoyment. I believe that'd be a, that'd be a revolutionary, re, revolutionary idea for a believer actually to enjoy their life, right? And to believe, you know, that they're walking in what God's called them to walk in. But he, I, 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 the Lord just reminded me of that in the last several days about entering into a season of rest. This is so, so important. Everybody say rest. rest. The majority of my Christian life, glory to God, thank you, Lord, the majority of my Christian life has been about working. Amen. Somebody say working. The majority of my Christian life has been about working, about striving. And, and I'm, there was nothing wrong with it in and of itself at the time. I mean, I think my, my heart was right. I wanted God to move. I wanted to move in the things of God. You know, but I found that a lot of my time and energy was working to try to get God to do something. Anybody with me? Amen. How many know that season is over? And it can't be just over for me. It's got to be over for you. Amen? What do you mean, Pastor? I mean that, man, I'd I'd, I'd go, I'd, now don't misunderstand me what I'm telling you this morning, but I would find myself, uh, you know, just constantly, like, I I couldn't even go on a a vacation. I remember years ago when Laura's family, they'd go on vacation at the beach. I would bring a backpack, I would bring a backpack filled with all my meditation sheets, uh, different CD series that I wanted to listen to and Bibles, et cetera. And I'd have this whole, Laura will tell you, and I'd find myself sitting in the bedroom while most of them were out at the beach enjoying themselves, but I'm locked in trying to just keep myself moving forward. What, What was that in essence? It was me working. Amen. And can I tell you as a testimony to testify today? It seems like in this season, the less I do, me personally, the less I do, the more God's doing. I mean, this is a total revolution here. What is that? That's grace. And I did not plan on grace. From the time that I got into the ministry, man, I worked, I worked, I worked. I'm more focused. My dad used to tell me years ago, he said, Darren, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Right? How many? Of, I'm sure some of you thought that about me or, you know, whoever. And we've all seen people like that where they're focused on the things of the Lord. Well, that was me. I was always more focused on the the things of the Spirit than I was the things of the natural, right? So I would strive in that. I would work in that. All of my years of ministry, I I I used to say like, like this. I'm putting all my effort, it seemed like, just to keep my neck above the water, Right? And I was striving and working. And I, my, my, my heart was right. My motives were right. I just wanted to walk in all that God had for me. Amen? But now in this season, somebody say this season. I tell you, if you don't realize as a believer, as a member of the body of Christ, as a Christian in this earth, if you don't realize that the seasons have changed, then you are not discerning, you know, where, where we are in the, as the body of Christ. 
If you have not discerned, can, can, I don't want to embarrass you. Maybe you can nod your head if you want to raise your hand. How many in this room, maybe you, I can't see you watching online, but how many in this room have discerned, you've been serving the Lord for more than a year or two, uh, maybe a handful of years or more. How many of you have discerned that something's different now than it was five or ten years ago? Anybody? Okay, a few hands. Yeah. It, I'm telling you, the season has changed. And I am a living witness of that. Amen. I, I pride myself in walking closely with the Lord. I'm not talking about working for it, but just being discerning. I'm, I'm uh, thinking about the scripture in the Old Testament. It talks about the sons of Issachar. And it said that they were discerners of the time in which they lived. That, that means they saw something that others didn't see. They discerned that God was about to do a new thing. They discerned that it was a new season. They discerned, right? What about Jesus when he came and he, uh, uh, I think he was talking about Jerusalem. And he said, or somewhere around his earth life, I don't know what city he was talking to. But he said that you guys can discern. Maybe he was talking to the Pharisees or Sadducees. He said, you can discern when the weather's going to change or when there's going to be a storm. But you did, you cannot discern when the Son of God actually appeared before for you? I mean, come on. I'm telling you right now, this is so important. Uh, thank you, Lord. This is so important for you and I to discern. Everybody say discern. <laughs> to, to get a hold of. When I say discern, it's a spiritual thing. You're, you're not, the, the, somebody quoted the verse the other day. They said, uh, while we, we don't look at the things that are seen, but we look at the things that are unseen. Hallelujah. While we look not at the things that are seen, but we look, as believers, we look at the things that are unseen. Somebody say unseen. unseen. What is unseen? It's that realm of the Spirit. It's that realm where God lives. It's that realm where Jesus lives. It's that realm where angels live. And also it's that realm where uh, devils and demons live. But to discern not according to what we can see with our physical eyes, but to discern in our heart, amen, that there is a, a, a time right now, I, I believe it's been preached for years and years and years, that the Lord's returning soon, and I believe that's true. I, I also believe right now that this is a season that there has been a shift, right, in the last you know, 10 or 20 years, probably in the last 5 to 10 years, there's been a major shift in the earth realm, in the body of Christ. Are you listening to me this morning? Now, if, if you're going to continue, this is where religion becomes a major problem in the body of Christ. Because religion says, we've always done it this way, and we're going to always continue to do it this way. That's, a, that's a, one of the stigmas that's attached to religion. I've always done it this way, and I'm going to always continue to do it this way. How many of y'all been a part of that in your lifetime at some point? I've always done it this way, and I'm always going to do it this way. Maybe there's spiritual leaders that they, man, we, bless God, we started this this way, and, you know, we don't want none of them guitars and lights and all that. that, that this stuff's all irrelevant. We could come out there on the, in the cow pasture out back and have a move of the Spirit just like we do in this bit. It, that, all this is irrelevant. This is for, well, I better not say that. It's, con, it's more contemporary, right? It's cultural. It don't mean we could take all this away. We can come back next week and we'll still have the same service that we have, right? But to stay and just say, I'm not moving. I'm not moving, you know? Like, I'm not going to budge because somebody else is doing that. Now, there, there may be some things we need to not budge on, right? And that's why we need to be discerning. But God is always moving. God is moving into the future. Somebody say, God's moving. We have to be discerning of what God is doing. If the cloud's moving, amen, that's the direction we need to go, right? There was a teaching uh, probably, uh, oh, Lord, I don't even know. We'll, we'll just say in the last 20 years. There was a teaching that came forth. I'm getting into my message now. Somebody said, praise the Lord. There was a teaching that came forth about, seemed like 20 years ago. Truthfully, truthfully, it came forth about 2,000 years ago through the Apostle Paul. But it reemerged and resurfaced probably in the 60s, 70s, and then other leaders in the early 2000s picked it up and really began to bring it to the body of Christ at large. And it was the message of grace. Everybody say grace. grace. And I got to be honest with you. <laughs> Where's the, I don't know if Alyssa's in here, but Alyssa and I, we, we got into a little uh, a conversation back in the office a few years ago, and she said this to me. 
She said, Pastor Darren, he's, he's in and out of grace. We got into a little disagreement. And I said, yeah, but, you know, there, you can't just go doing this, that, and the other. So she said, well, you, you, you go in and out of grace. You get in grace, you know, you believe grace, then you get out of it, then you get back into grace. And, and you, know, you know what? She was right. As a pastor and as a leader, I was still struggling with the reality of the grace of God myself. Amen. And it was a couple, two or three years ago, Laura and I ended up going to a conference. Uh, I've talked about it. Uh, a well-known pastor up in Atlanta. And it was a conference on the grace of God. And I want to tell you that that conference absolutely changed my life. It solidified everything that God had been trying to get. Oh, I'm headed somewhere. Please listen to me this morning. It solidified everything that God was trying to get into my heart and get me fully grounded in that I was resisting. Why? Because I just told this to somebody the other day. Christianity without grace. Everybody say that with me. Say Christianity without grace. Christianity without grace. I'm going to tell you how you know whether you're walking in grace or not. Christianity without grace, your attention and focus is on yourself. When you have truly been liberated, let me say that again, Christianity, where all or most of the attention is on you. Everybody point to yourself, say me. What do you mean by that, Pastor Aaron? You're, wor- you're worried about, am I keeping all the rules? Am I keeping all the laws? Did I read my Bible today? Oh, I treated that person poorly. Now I'm condemned for the rest of the day or the week. Or I'm not getting my healing because I haven't been in church in the last three weeks. Or because I did committed this sin, so there's no way that God can heal me. Or I, the Lord led me to evangelize to this person, and I didn't do it. Now I'm under a, a, a curse, and God's mad at me, and I can't be blessed by God. Or uh, even on a higher level, oh, God can't bless me financially because I skipped sowing my offering this week. If That is your brand of Christianity. Hear me. Please listen to me. If that is your brand of Christianity where all of the focus and the attention is on you and your performance. Can I get a witness in here? If your brand of Christianity. Somebody said, how how does this look? I'm telling you how it looks. You're always under shame. You're always under condemnation. You don't ever feel like you measure up. Oh, I did this and did that. I committed this sin and I committed that sin. And now God's mad at me and I'm disconnected from God. I just want to be back in the presence of God. That is a brand of Christianity that is based upon keeping a set of rules and laws. And guess what? That's not Jesus' brand of Christianity. I know this is controversial because I got, there's still that little bit of, no, there's a lot of bit of that spirit of religion that says, oh, bless God, we need to put the Ten Commandments back in the courthouses. Folks, you can have them or not have them. Folks are still going to break them. And that's a whole nother sermon. The Ten, oh, help me, Jesus. No grace based Christianity. Somebody said it this way. Grace puts all the attention on Jesus. Oh, I could just hear all y'all little, some of y'all little smoke coming out of yours right now. Yeah, but Pastor Darren, that's a slippery, slippery slope. Because if you start preaching on grace, let me say it in my way that I say it. If you start preaching the gospel, then people might just want to keep on sinning. I could see some of y'all. Y'all could see some of y'all's faces. I'm going to put up a big mirror up here one day so y'all can see. <laughs> yeah, but if you preach grace, no, what you mean to say is if you preach the gospel. Are you listening? Yes. Somebody said, no, it's, it's, somebody said it's the gospel of grace. No, it's just the gospel. And the gospel means it's the too good to be true news. What we've got in modern day Christianity, it's been going on for centuries, millennia really, since Jesus rose from the dead. There's been what, and we could go through scripture upon scripture. We've got a mixture. We've got a mixture of Christian, a brand of Christianity that mixes the law 
and grace. Right? And there's a whole teaching in the Old Testament about mixture. We, they don't mix. It's like oil and gas. It's either Jesus paid it all or you still have to keep the law. I like what Creflo Dollar says. He said, if you're going to keep the law, you better put that pork chop and pork rib down because that's part of the law too. Now, what we want to do is we want to get our little pet sins. And we want to make them high on the chart, but then our little sins that we don't acknowledge as sin, those, that's not part of the law. No, there's a bunch of laws. And here's the good news. Jesus paid it all. Somebody said, oh, then you're saying, so if a person becomes born again, then they could just go on and live a life of sin? No, I'll say what Paul said. Certainly not. Why would you? Why would you? I like what Jacob said on one of the Wednesday nights recently. He said, anybody that's been genuinely born again, they don't want to continue willingly to live a life of total sin and rebellion to God. You'd have to question whether that person was born again in the first place, right? Because when you're born again, God's life and nature comes on the inside of you, right? And you want to please God. If you're walking with the Lord, now you could live in a backslidden state, right? Hello? You could live in a backslidden state. Having been born again and slipped on back into some of your old ways, really what it is is just living a fleshly existence, right? Appealing, only doing what your body wants you to do and only going down those paths. But if you've been born again, Jesus, you're born again, right? Some of my Baptist brothers would like this sermon. This, we own the once saved, always saved, right? The grace did it. Here's the message of the gospel. God gave a law. Everybody say law. Man could not keep the law. Everybody say they couldn't do it. God gave his son, right, who kept the law. Everybody say he kept the law. Jesus kept the law, right, because he wasn't born from man. He was born from God. He didn't have the sin nature in him. Jesus kept the law, and then he died. You see that, how I walked on the other side of the pulpit to keep my line going? Did you catch that? That was a smooth move, wasn't it? Okay, we'll go, go back over here. God made a law. I'm sorry, God created man. What did man do? They, they pretty much screwed it up from the beginning, right? And don't, don't you act so holy, because if you were there, you'd have done the same thing. Hello? Yeah, I saw some heads nodding. Man, man fell. God got a covenant with Abraham, right? What was the purpose of God's covenant with Abraham? Remember Abraham said, I'm going to, God said, give me your son, right? Anybody know the story? Abraham got his son that he believed God for, Isaac. God said, offer your son as a sacrifice. Abraham gets up there on the mountain, ties him up. He's going to plunge the knife. The angel comes and stops. says, stop. God knows you're willing to release your son. Pretty much the kid was been sacrificed already. In Abraham's heart, it was already a done deal. Somebody, that's revelation right there. So good. Let the Holy Spirit give you something on that. Abraham sacrificed his son, so then right from that moment, you know, there's a, there's a type, right, or a shadow. Abraham said, he said, since you weren't will, unwilling to withhold your own son, God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my son, right? He exchanged. There was a covenant that was forged with Abraham. What happened with, when God started the covenant with Abraham? Abraham birthed a nation, right? Hello? What, what The nation of Israel that we know today, right? Remember uh, Jacob wrestled with God, wrestled with an angel, right? Got, got his hip all busted up, then he walked like a gangster, you know, the rest of his days, like, what, what? I've been wrestling with an angel, you know? He said, uh, right then, Jacob got his name changed to Israel. That's where the nation of Israel came from. So God started a covenant with one man who had his, his sons later became the nation of Israel, the tribes of Israel, what did they do through that nation? They established a law. What was it? God's law. Remember Moses came down from the, the thing with the Ten Commandments, right? And I love that. I said it before, but it's so funny. Moses was the first person to break all Ten Commandments. Yeah, you're right. He threw them down and broke them all at one time, right? Moses broke, but there's a type in that. The commandments were made to be broken. If some of you hear what I'm saying, this is not what I have in my notes today. If some of you had listened to me, I promise you could at least get the seed of freedom like Pastor Frank was preaching today during the, the communion. The seeds of freedom can be planted in your heart today. Are you listening? The commandments were made. The, the second he came down from the mountain, he threw them down. All the commandments were broken, which tells me the commandments were made to be broken. 
They were never, the commandments were never made to be kept. Why? Because we can't keep them. You can't keep the commandments. How many of y'all have tried? Yeah, I'm talking about a 20-year journey for me in some of this. I used to try and try and try, and finally, at some point during my walk with the Lord, I just threw in the towel because I realized this is futile. I cannot keep the law, period. It'd be some of you, would be, you'd be probably set free this morning if you just said that out of your own mouth. I can't keep the law. Amen. That was your cue. I can't keep the law. You can try, but you can't keep it. Amen. So where does all my Christian zeal, what do I direct it towards? You direct it towards him. So what happened? God established that uh, people, the people established the law. They had a whole sacrificing system where when the law was broken, you know, they had to offer this and offer that and pay for this and pay for that. And they'd shed the blood. I think it was Solomon who said when they offered sacrifice to the Lord, they said they offered so many sacrifices that the blood literally ran down the street. There was so much blood. Everybody say blood. I mean, they just shed the blood, more blood and lots of blood. Blood was everywhere, right? What was that saying? All through that old covenant system, there's no God said in himself out of his own mouth. There's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. But this is, well, I'm giving you about 6,000 years of Bible in 30 minutes today. They realized, God said, from the beginning of Adam and Eve, right? From the beginning of Adam and Eve, right? It said that they sinned. What happened? They went and sowed fig leaves on themselves, right? Fig leaves ain't going to cover it. That's why Jesus probably cursed the fig tree in the, in the, when he was walking around the earth, right? Fig leaves ain't going to cut it. That's man's way to cover their own sin. Are you listening? So what happened? Then it shows they were covered with animal skin. Why? Because some blood's got to flow when sin is moving. So that whole old covenant, the whole thing with the nation of Israel and their whole establishment of law and their system of sacrifice and blood, blood, blood. What was it saying? But here's the cool thing about it. Hebrews talks about this. It said that those Old Testament saints, they, they sacrificed those animals. The blood flowed. But here's what never happened for those Old Testament believers. Does anybody listen to me today? Here's what never happened for those Old Testament. Where did my, my towel go? What those Old Testament believers never had, listen to me, oh, this is so good. They never had a clear conscience. It's in the book of Hebrews. Because the sacrifice of animals never completely wiped away or reconnected them to God. They still had to live in a sinful condition. They still had the remembrance of their sin. They still had the shame of their sin. But because of the animal's shed blood, the, 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 the penalty for that sin was not carried out on them. It was carried out on the animal. <coughs> Are you listening? But when Jesus came, his blood, boy, I couldn't have picked this better myself. Thank you, Lord. Right on the communion day. His blood forever purged the sinfulness of man. Boy, I'm about to get so happy I can jump through this ceiling in a minute. Praise God. His blood forever wiped away, purged us of that evil conscience. Oh, glory to God. Somebody say, thank you for the blood. So my point in saying that is this. Through that old covenant, they knew they couldn't kept the law. That's why the blood, the streets flowed with blood. There's just sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. You know, somebody said, uh, I read an article in the last couple years, said they started making sacrifices again uh, somewhere in Israel under that old covenant law. Started making sacrifices again, sacrifices again. But how I many of those sacrifices, they're, they're, number one, they're not needed now. It's almost irrelevant, but they don't have that revelation yet, right? A lot of the Jewish people. 
But Jesus shed his blood, the Bible says in Hebrews, once and for all. We don't need another sacrifice. Can I ask you a deep question this morning? Why are you paying the price, mainly in the currency of shame and guilt, for the sins that you have committed over and over and over? Why do you keep paying the price for something that Jesus already paid for? It's like you're just bringing the animals and you're just, you're bringing the animal every day and just <laughs> sacrifice. When we went to Haiti, we'd, a couple times you'd watch over the roof and they'd, <laughs> you'd see a goat running around there on the mountain, right? Then after, then you'd look over and you'd see a couple guys grab the goat. Then you'd hear, <laughs> and then about two hours later, you'd be sitting down at the table having some goat. Why do we continually bring those sacrifices, right? Jesus already paid for all of our sin, past, present, and future. So if you're going to put your attention and energy into anything, put it into learning how to operate in the grace of God, right? Stop putting your effort into keeping the rules, and let me, let, me, let me just give you a little prophetic thing this morning. This is so important because you and I will not be able to fulfill our destiny if we are still walking in any semblance of law or legalism. We must be a free people to walk in the fullness of what God has prepared for us. Do you know why I believe this is a, one of those keys where a lot, why a lot of people are not walking in more fullness of God? They're still walking in an accordance to some kind of a set of laws. Somebody said, Pastor Darren, isn't it good to keep the laws a believer? No, not if you're doing it for the wrong reason. Amen. I believe you can honor God with your spirit, soul, and body, and, and, but you're not getting any reward for keeping a set of rules. So am I promoting anarchy today that everybody should just go and do what they, their flesh tells them to do? No, but my goodness, if you did, you're, you're, still, you're, you're in Christ. The fact that you live out of your flesh and out of your soul does not disqualify you from being in Christ. This is a spiritual work that has uh, effect in our spirit. Come on, somebody say the blood is enough. I know I'm stepping on some of those. I can hear some religious cows mooing right now. And you know, like they say, the dog that gets hit with the rock yelps the loudest. If you're starting to get a little bit questionable and angry at some of the things I'm saying, you better watch out. You probably got a spirit of religion following you. And I'm going to tell you because I love you, this stuff dogged my tracks for 20 years. Now, when I was a baby Christian, man, when I sinned, I was down for like a month. Anybody with me? You did something, you probably, oh man, you're just down for a month. You couldn't, you couldn't get that shame off of you. But then when you start growing up as a believer, you realize, wow, you know, I did something I shouldn't have done. You know, now it's only hung on me for a week. Then you walk on, and you, well, about a few years later, you're still growing, right? You did something, now it's like two or three days. Then when you keep growing, then when you get a hold of grace, I mean, I'm sorry, on down the road, now you did something, and it lasts about three hours. A little shame and condemnation on you. But then when you start walking it out, you do something dumb, you almost can get to a point where it bother you for about three minutes or doesn't even bother you at all. Now, hear me closely. I'm not talking about just going out there and living like the devil on purpose because you're saved. That, my friends, is stupidity. And any believer in their right mind that's walking with the Lord that wants to willingly and blatantly go against what Jesus died for, that's just stupid. And, and, and the Lord has to reveal that to you. Hallelujah. But like Paul said, I guess you could if you wanted to. That's the extent of grace. I guess you could if you wanted to. It's mighty quiet in this Presbyterian church. But why would you? That's, that's like the book of Proverbs said, a dog returning to his own vomit. I got a flesh just like all y'all got. Right? I'm not exempt from my flesh. I'm not exempt from the, the devil's attacks. 
And the truth is, I miss it from time to time. Hello? I'd be an idiot if I stood up here and said I didn't. I miss it. But I'm walking in a new level where I understand that Jesus' blood has covered it all. Can I please encourage you with this? Please don't. I just, I pray and ask the Holy Spirit right now to show you where that spirit of religion and legalism and law. The, the truth is, the majority of believers are blind to it. There's nothing more that the devil wants than a church still living and trying to keep a set of rules. Because then G, the devil knows that you ain't got it. You ain't got a hold of the gospel yet. What we've embraced as the gospel, again, I'll reiterate, is a mixture of law and grace. It's good enough to maybe get us in, but then we have to keep the law to keep us in. So we've got a mixture no, I'd rather be walking in the too good to be true news. Because the truth is, you and I are going to miss it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to miss it. Most of you probably missed it this morning. <laughs> missed it, meaning you come short of God's, what does it say? Sin. Everybody say sin. You know, sin. You know, y'all heard people talk about this. Where, you know where that word came from, sin? It's when the archers would shoot. And they were headed for the bullseye. And they'd have the guys down there to collect the arrows, and they'd shoot the arrow. And when it missed the bullseye, the guys down there by the bullseye would shout out, Sin! Sin! What does that mean? You missed the mark. How many of y'all have missed the mark in the last week? And the rest of y'all are lying. <laughs> the truth is, you still live in a dirt house. You're going to miss it. You live in it, you got a flesh. You got a body, you got a mind that still in this world is subject to Satan and, and, and subject to the attacks of Satan. You're not willingly, sub, you don't, you're not throwing in the towel like you got to do what he tells you to do. But he's going to attack you, right? So you're under that, you got a flesh. This is why the Apostle Paul said, don't walk in and fulfill those other two things. It doesn't mean that you're not saved if you do. No, he says what? Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the spirit. That, this is something that, this is how you and I overcome that lower life. Right? We walk in the spirit. But let me tell you, folks, if not walking in the spirit guaranteed that you lost your salvation, then the majority of the church world will be going straight to hell. Did you hear what I just said? If walking, if not walking in the spirit basically said that believers went to hell, then we're, we're all going there. No, the, the fact, the cold hard fact is the majority of believers are carnal. We're, we're soulish. We walk in our in intellect and we walk out of our bodies, urges, and desires. Very few people in the body of Christ. Now, we're, this is what we're here to change. Very few people in the body of Christ know how to walk in the spirit. Myself included. I'm in the same boat. I'm learning myself to, how to learn how to walk. But be, just because I'm not yet able to fully walk in the spirit does not mean that I'm not saved. It means that I'm carnal. Right? Carnality is not a disqualification for salvation. Did you hear what I just said? Just because you walk in the flesh doesn't mean you're saved. It just means you're walking in the flesh. Are you listening? Oh, man. I'm about out of time. Listen to this, Ephesians 2, 7. We, we need this. We need this. It was 2007. This is ironic because I, this is when I started struggling the most in my, in my life, around 2007. It seemed like, you know, all of hell just opened up and started showing up at my door every day. And it's about that time that I started getting, I, this is what I call it, I started getting sick of religion. Because the Lord started revealing to me, I started hating Religion. And this is what I mean by religion. I started hating, oh man. You ever read that story in the New Testament? Or I think it was in the Gospels where Jesus told a story about there's the guy, the religious guy that's, you know, he's done all his thing. He's paid his tithe. He's, he's said his prayers. Oh, Lord God, I'm not like the sinner and the heathen. And Jesus is telling the story. And then he said there's another guy over there that's just broken and beating his chest. He said, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm worth nothing, blah, blah. And it's almost like he, he drew a parallel. 
this is not good, the religion. This is what God said I'm looking for right here. I'm looking for this guy that knows that he ain't got it together. Because that other stuff, and here's what the spirit of religion said to me. Everybody say, I'm listening. I started realizing, like they say, I, I didn't think my stuff stunk. I didn't think what I did, I thought what I did was perfect. No, my, my heart was right. I was just wrong. Hello? I thought because I went to church, I was better than the guy that didn't come to church. And I'm not saying not going to church is good or bad. And you know, being in the house of God where God calls you there, that's where you need to be. I started thinking because I was spirit filled that I was better than some of the churches down the road. Because I've had that extra experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I spoke with other tongues. And then I started thinking, man, I, I operate in the gifts of the Spirit. I'm definitely better than some of them frozen chosen. This is what my attitude was. And this is what God started dealing with me about in 2007. That this is religion. And it'd be a shame some of you to leave this building today and think that you're better than somebody else because you actually came and fulfilled your religious obligation to be at church today. That's religion. It's even, a, even stretching a little bit because you su supposedly brought your tithe and offering today that you did something and you're better than the person that didn't. What, what, is it, what am I saying again? Back to point one. If the focus is on you and your performance, then it's not on him and his performance. Religion says, what can I do? Christianity, true Christianity says, what did he do? All the attention. Really, this whole thing, it should be about him from start to finish. Can I just give you a couple scriptures before I let you go today? Oh, glory to God. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. Nothing worse, I tell you, there's nothing, nothing worse. There may be something worse, but there's nothing worse in my book and in my sermon today than a religious Christian. Oh, my goodness. It makes you want to get toss up your lunch. It's bad. It's bad and it smells and it's terrible. There's nothing worse than a religious Christian because it's really, it's the opposite of what a true Christian is. A true Christian has been saved let, let me show you in the Bible that in the ages to come, somebody said oh there he goes, he's on another tangent like last week, we'll be out here like 3 p.m. today. <laughs> that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his what? Grace. Somebody say Grace. In his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Okay? God's going to be doing this forever. He's going to be revealing the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For by what? Grace. For by what? Grace. grace you've been what? Grace. Saved through your faith. It's not of yourselves. This is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Amen? Look at another translation, New Living. It says, so God can point to us in all future... Oh, glory to God. God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His what? His grace and kindness toward us. If you think God is a merciless judge that is still after you for every little mistake that you make, then you don't know what this verse says. It says it's in his incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all that he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his what? Grace. By his grace so that when, or when you believe you can't take credit for this. This is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. Good works don't get you into salvation, and good works don't keep you in salvation. Are you listening? This is a work. If I were to do a translation of this, this is a work from beginning to end of grace. What is grace? Can I give you three quick things? I'll let you go. One person said sure, so we have a majority. God, grace defined. Grace defined. Everybody knows this one. Grace, number one, unmerited favor. Everybody say unmerited favor. Undeserved favor. Somebody say favor. Kindness, goodness. Undeserved, yeah, you didn't work for it. You got a paycheck, but you didn't work for it. How many of y'all would like that job? 
I got a paycheck, but I didn't do anything to get it. And this is a big old paycheck, right? Unmerited, undeserved, unrestrained kindness. That's one definition. Number two, God's influence, God's or divine influence upon the human heart. How did you get saved? Let me tell you how I got saved. I was minding my own business, on my way to hell, not even thinking about the plan of God. Amen? And then all of a sudden, what happened? Something from above started flowing in here. And then I said, my God, something ain't right with me. Something I need, something I didn't even know what it was. Something was stirring in here. What was that? Grace. If you come down here and you get saved because you kept all the rules, you ain't saved, son. This is a work of grace from beginning to end. His grace started dealing with me on the inside. And then I, I found myself sitting over back over here in this section, right? I found myself sitting back over here. Then the presence of God, the glory of God just came upon me during a service. And the power of God, man, I just came down here. Didn't get saved, didn't give my life to the Lord that, that, that day. Came down here, and where's Miss Kena? She was sitting right here. Came down here, man, just started weeping. And she just put her arms around me and prayed for me and loved on me. What was that that was doing that? Was that Darren trying to get it all right? No, it was grace. Oh, what? man, I wish we had some more time today. Grace. Somebody say grace. God's influence upon the human heart. Number three, and this is one of my favorites. Number three, well, they're all just about equally as good. Number three is God's ability. Somebody say God's ability. Grace is God's ability. Christians, this is what the Lord, I was praying this out last night at my house. Praying in the spirit, and this is what came out of my spirit. Look for grace. Look for grace. Somebody say, look for grace. Look for grace. Psalms 127.1 says this. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. If God is not building his work with his ability in your life, then you are working in vain. I'm going to say that again. If you are trying to do the will of God in your own ability, then you are building in vain. What this Christian life should look like, and it's designed to look like, and it was planned to look like, was God's ability. Everybody say ability. God's ability, God's grace comes upon you to do the work that he's called you to do. Then you are guaranteed that you are actually doing the work. Oh, my God. Then you are actually guaranteed that you are doing the work that God has called you to do. If you're not operating in grace, you're probably not yielded or have not found or are not doing the work that God has called you to do. Because when you find God's work, you're going to find God's grace. And this is why in this season that I have entered into a season of a time of rest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What does that mean? That means when God needs me to do something, he puts his ability on me and lets me know what I need to do. What is that? It's grace. It's God's divine ability influencing my heart. God's ability coming upon me to do a certain task. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Y'all hear you done gone home. Got to say it. Hebrews 4.10. He who has entered into what? He who has entered into what? Has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Referring to God resting on the seventh day. It should not be us working. We shouldn't be working. God should be working through us. If you're having to manufacture everything that you do for God and muster up the ability to do it in, you must not have found yet what God's called you to do. Because when you're in your place, there's an abundance of grace. Now, now, now I do want to end with this because I, I don't want to get two weeks in a row preaching long. I got, this, this came to me this morning. I just want to give you this. You can come on up, Travis, to give people hope. <laughs> Listen to this. What, I want to end with this. This is so good. What would our 
lives look like. Just, just uh, don't be distracted right now for the next minute or two. If you want to just close your eyes, just pay attention regardless. What would our lives look like if God's favor, unmerited favor, God's ability, His power, and His influence was upon our lives daily. L listen to me what I'm telling you. What would our lives look like? Now, there's two ways to look at this. What would our lives look like individually? And what would our lives look like corporately? If every single one of us had God's favor, unmerited favor, kindness and goodness, if favor flowed like a river in our lives, God just being in an unlimited fashion, being kind and good, it just continuously, God's unreserved, unlimited favor just flowing like a river in our lives. If God's influence was upon our heart, divine influence, where we, we didn't have to work it up and we didn't have to strive to do it, but God just started dealing with us, hey, you need to forgive that person. That's grace. When the Spirit moves on you and you said, you've been holding resentment on, on, against this person, you need to fix that. That's grace. That's not you trying to keep a law. Forgive and God will forgive you. No, that's, that's the law. Grace says, I'm going to influence you with my spirit. I'm going to influence you by my word. And I'm going to stir within you. Uh, uh, Mark Hankins texts uh, Laura and I, the other week, a couple weeks ago, and said, I think it's Philippians 2.13. I get my references mixed up on this verse. But he said, it's God all the while effectually at work within you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What is that? That is the home that is the home button for grace. It's God all the while effectually at work within you and I, both giving, basically giving us the ability to do and to fulfill his good pleasure. God all the while, that's a Christian. This other brand is the Christian religion, the cultural Christian. The, I'm a Christian in, in name only. But I don't got no grace. I don't got no favor. I don't got no God's influence on my life. I don't have God's ability resting upon me. No, you have been called and graced to walk in the fullness of what God has for you. But you can't get it by keeping a law. You can't get it by serving a lot. You can't get it by giving too much. You can't get it by showing up at church every week. You only get it when you humble yourself under God's mighty hand. How do you find grace? Amen? How do you find it? What would our lives look like? What would our... Oh, let me go back to that. Uh, um, oh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I lost it. First Peter 5. It said, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility. For God... And there is a there's a 28 week sermon right here in this one little ending part of that verse 5 God resists God cannot will not release his grace on those who are proud and proud people well, let me break it down to where you live proud people are the ones that say I got this I can keep these rules. I can be a church. I can serve. I can give my money. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do all this. That's a proud person. Without acknowledging, it's his ability that gives me this love to do all these things. This ain't, this ain't about me. He said, but he gives grace. God gives unmerited favor, divine influence upon our heart, and his own, very own ability, God gives that to the humble. Those who humble themselves. You want to find grace today? Hallelujah. Message translation says on verse 6, God has had it with the proud, but takes delight in plain people. So be content with who you are and don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you. He'll promote you at the right time. 
Just follow the Lord. Follow that divine influence. Hallelujah. Everybody stand up on your feet this morning. Follow that. Follow the, follow the Lord. Follow that divine influence. Follow that, that ability. How do you know what you're supposed to do? God's dealing with you about what you're supposed to do. Hallelujah. I want to end with, say to reiterate, what would our lives look like? What would our marriages look like with grace? And let me skip down to number seven. What would our country look like with grace? Because right now, you got pretty much proud people on every side you look. Everybody's proud. I'm right, you're wrong. How about we both join hands and humble ourselves and say, God, give us a direction. And listen, I get it. The proud, some people will never humble themselves. They can. They have the ability. You can pray it. You can pray it for them. God would humble them. Give them a, help them to humble themselves, rather. But some people, that's the problem with flesh. Flesh and spiritual immaturity and spiritually dead people, they pretty much going to do what they want to do. But all the while, let me, let me speak this. Pro- Proverbs 1. Wisdom says, I cry aloud in the streets. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? He said, I'm, I'm shouting out. I'm giving you wisdom. But you go about and do what you want to do. Kenneth Hagin, close your eyes this morning. Kenneth Hagin prophesied in 2003. And this is part of his prophecy. He said this. He said, walk not by what you see. Everybody bow your heads and listen to this. Walk not by what you see, but walk according to my, what my word says. Walk according to what the Holy Ghost is saying unto you. Listen to this. For he is speaking unto many hearts, and they walk on. you got to hear this this morning. He is speaking. This is the Lord speaking through the, the office of the prophet. He said, for he, the Lord, is speaking. He's speaking. He's speaking unto many hearts. And they walk on in the natural and pay no attention to their heart. He's speaking to many spirits. They walk on in the realm of the mental, thinking their own thoughts, planning their own way. But yea, saith the Lord of hosts, listen to what the Spirit is saying to your heart, to your spirit, and what he said to you, act upon it, act upon it, act like it's so, rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. The Spirit is speaking to many hearts. What would our lives look like if we just yielded to grace? Hallelujah. Just do it now. Just yield to grace. Just say, Lord, I yield to grace. Say it to yourself. Tell the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry for being proud and striving. God, God rested on the seventh day. And he said, when we enter into this grace and stand in this grace, we rest just like he did. Rest and we cease from our own works. We work as he moves through us. That is the Christian life. Father, I just bless your people today. We just seal this word with a praise from our heart. We thank you, Lord. Come on, somebody say thank you, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for your grace. Just yield to that grace today. Lord, I bless your people. I just want to lead you in a simple confession this morning. If you're watching online, you know, maybe you've been born again before. You've been saved, giving your heart to the Lord. I just want to give you an opportunity, if you've never done that, to do that this morning. But just reconfess this confession. This is what you're confessing to. He did all the work. I think sometimes when we make a confession of faith in the Lord, we're saying, I'm going to keep all the rules, Lord. No, that's, that's, not, the, that's not the gospel. The gospel is he kept all the work. He did all the work, and I get all the blessings. And I just got to walk by faith in that. You can't do something to get it. You can't do something to lose it. You just keep on moving forward, thanking him for his grace. Man, I tell you, this is going to bring a revolution to this church. This, this little deposit this morning, an impartation, what I call it, of the spirit of grace. This will revolutionize this place. Now, you're not, you may not get it on take one. 
But you you keep meditating on this. Keep moving forward. We're gonna, we release the spirit of grace on you today. Let's all make a confession of faith in Christ who actually paid the full price for our sin. He didn't save us so that we could keep all the law. He kept all the law so that he could save us. Modern Christianity is almost a backwards model of what God actually did in Christ. But we're saying no this morning to our own efforts and striving. And I promise you from this, from this moment forward, for so many of you in here, a spirit of rest is coming upon you in your home. You've been striving and fighting for your marriages. You've been striving and fighting financially. I'm telling you, let the grace of God open up the doors of financial prosperity for you, of healing and restoration in your marriage. Let the, the grace of God work on your back to see you move past some of the things that have been holding you back, to bring healing to your heart and to your family. Grace, 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 grace. I release grace all over this place. Somebody say this with me. Everybody confess and say, I receive the gospel that Jesus paid the full price for my sin and the sin of the world. He shed his blood once and for all. It's a done deal. I put my faith in that work. It is finished. I am a child of God, and I walk in the grace of God. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. Give the Lord a great big shout of praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I love you, and I bless you. Make sure you love on somebody today. Amen. Be a blessing to somebody. We'll see you on Wednesday night. Have a great week. Wow, what a powerful service. What a wonderful message that we cannot do anything. We cannot strive for God's goodness in our life, but His grace covers all. Such a powerful story that was given this morning. We are so thankful that you joined us online. Hey, if you haven't already, we want to um, encourage you to like, share, and comment on our Facebook page. Maybe you know someone who needs this exact message, and this is a great way to get it to them. If you received healing or if you accepted Christ for your first time today, we want to know about it. So either comment or you can privately message us. Maybe you want to partner with us financially. We want to give you the opportunity to do so. If you look in the comments section, you can find a give link where it will take you exactly to where you need to be on the website to give.